Should you turn off hyper-threading or should you kill the e-cores? Intel users have been arguing about this for years, so today we're going to settle this. I benchmarked 16 modern games on my 14900K with three configurations. Full stock, hyper-threading turned off, and then the e-cores turned off. I'll be showing you guys live side-by-side -side gameplay with the raw FPS figures along with 1% and 0.1% lows, so you can actually see what's going on and which setup gives you the best gaming performance. Let's get into it. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here, welcome back to the channel, and I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to be revisiting a topic that I've tackled on the channel a couple of times now, and that is finding out if turning off the e-cores or hyper-threading is beneficial when it comes to gaming performance on Intel processors, which use a hybridized architecture. Intel CPUs from the 12th generation Alder Lake series to the 14th generation Raptor Lake series, like the 12700K or 14900K, utilize a mixture of P cores, also known as performance cores, which support hyper-threading. And along with that, you get a set of E cores, which are known as efficient cores that are generally clocked much lower and don't support hyper-threading. So the idea behind this whole approach, just to kind of put it on a brief nutshell, is that for your main tasks, like gaming, for example, or when you're using a workstation application, those tasks are handled by the performance cores, so they do the heavy lifting there, while the e-cores handle a lot of the background tasks. But there are other ways you can flip that around, but we won't get into that here. This hybridized approach has resulted in some massive performance gains for these Intel chips when it comes to multi-threading performance, which is very useful for productivity and workstation applications, as they do generally scale with multiple cores. However, when it comes to gaming performance, most games still generally rely on a dominant single thread worker, hence faster single core performance is preferred. However, over the years, game engines have started to become a lot more advanced and have started to become quite multi-threaded as well, such as, you know, games like Battlefield 6, even going back to games that released five years ago, like Cyberpunk. There's plenty of games out there now that you can see even from my own past benchmarks that show them utilizing multiple cores and threads. And even a lot of single player games are starting to do that now too. This has been a ongoing debate amongst Intel users for the past few years. And from my experience, there really isn't any sort of like definitive answer because it really depends on the type of game that you're gonna be playing. It's engine that it's built on and also how it's optimized by the, by the developers. Some games will utilize and prefer hyper-threading and some games will actually take advantage of the e-cores and some games may not even cure it at all. So it really depends on which one will provide you with the best performance. There were a couple of reasons why I wanted to make this video and why I figured it was re worth revisiting because there have been many new games which have released, which I've been curious to test. And along with that, in the past, I've only presented my findings in bar charts. And that was because I didn't have a dedicated capture card, so I didn't want my recording to affect my results. But I did get the Elgato 4KX capture card earlier this year, and it's been a very useful tool in terms of mitigating that problem for me, and also being able to provide you guys with some more, you know, interactive benchmarks. And so this is why I can show you guys live demonstrations on what happens when you disable e-cores or hyper-threading for all these games. By the end of this video, you'll know exactly, you know, which configuration I'd recommend for these different types of games and whether it's worth you diving into the BIOS to tweak this on your own system. So before we dive into, you know, the gameplay and the results, let me quickly walk you guys through the test system specifications. And along with that, you know, give you a bit of an overview on how I tested the games. So for the CPU, we're of course going to be using my 14900K, which has its P cores running at 5.8 gigahertz. The E cores have been bumped to 4.6 gigahertz and the ring is running at 5 gigahertz. It's cooled by MSI's E360 AIO paired with 48 gigabytes of DDR5 8000 CL36 memory running on the MSI Z790 M power motherboard. The GPU we'll be using is my overclocked RTX 4090, which has its core running at 3000 MHz, and the memory has a plus 1500 offset in MSI Afterburner. The games are stored on a 4TB Corsair MP600 Pro LPX 
NVMe SSD, and powering all the components is an EVGA 1000G3 power supply. The operating system running on my test bench is Windows 11 IoT Enterprise with some additional deep loading. I tested all of the games at 1080p using low settings to make the tests more CPU bound, and you guys will see the hardware stats through the overlay from MSI Afterburner and Rivatuner statistics along with the average FPS, 1% lows and 0.1% lows. With that out of the way, let's take a look at our first game, and that is Battlefield 6 using the custom portal benchmark map. Here we can see that the two configs where E cores are turned on are showing slightly higher lows than when we have E cores disabled, and that is because Battlefield 6 will scale with multiple cores and threads, as evident by the CPU power usage, but turning off those E cores can also help save a bit on the power usage. Moving on, and we have Arc Raiders, a game that I've been playing a lot of lately, and what we see here is actually the opposite compared to what we saw in Battlefield 6, where we have the E cores disabled and just leave hyper threading on, we see the lows are more stable. Average FPS across the board stays relatively the same. Nonetheless, performance across all three configurations will be smooth. I'm not going to get Black Ops 7, and I don't recommend anyone get that trash game either, so I'll be sticking with Black Ops 6 for my benchmark suite until we get a good COD game, if at all, but as you guys can see, performance across all three configurations is similar for the most part. Turning off E cores provides us with higher lows, but it's not a huge difference. The next game we're going to be taking a look at is Counter-Strike 2, and this game's engine does this weird thing where when you leave the FPS completely uncapped, it actually hurts your 1% and 0.1% lows despite getting like 900 FPS average. So what was recommended to me is to run this benchmark without the cap and then see what the average FPS result is and then just set a cap equal to that minus 10%. Because before I was seeing my 0.1% and 1% lows in like the mid 200s or even below that, but after setting the cap, we see a dramatic increase. As for the performance between the configurations, we see that stock does the worst, whereas when we disable hyper-threading and leave E-cores on, the lows increase, but the same also happens when we disable the E-cores, so it seems like just having the full 32 threads seems to lower performance for some reason. Marvel Rivals is next, and overall, performance is very similar across the board for the average FPS and the lows. No major differences between the three configurations, so let's move on. Even at 1080p low settings, Monster Hunter Wilds runs like complete garbage for the visuals it offers, and regardless of whether you disable E-cores or disable hyper-threading, it's not going to be impacting the performance in any major way. The engine itself is just not built for this kind of game, and there's no way they can go back and obviously change that. So here's hoping that for the next installment, they do find something else that's better optimized. Final Fantasy Dontrill is the next benchmark we're going to be taking a look at, as this represents how performance can be impacted in a MMO type game, and this scene in particular shows a large raid with lots of players and monsters. When it comes to performance between the three configurations, it seems like hyper-threading allows for about a 5% boost as the configuration without it shows the lowest average FPS, but the 1% and 0.1% lows are basically within margin of error. Let's move on to a newer single-player title, and I got a chance to try out the Outer Worlds 2, which unfortunately runs on Unreal Engine 5, and it runs into the same problem that I found with Borderlands 4. Graphics that are on the cartoonish side, it's like you're getting a lot of noisy textures, and yet the performance seen here makes it seem like you're getting some super photorealistic visuals. In any case, we see that with our configurations, with hyper-threading disabled and the E-cores on, performance is the best, offering really stable 1% and 0.1% lows, so it seems like hyper-threading actually hurts the lows. In Dying Light the Beast, we see that performance felt the smoothest by leaving hyper-threading on and having the E-cores disabled. We see a jump of around 7% for the 1% lows and 11% for the 0.1% lows, so the opposite of what we saw with the Outer Worlds 2. Moving on, and we have Cyberpunk 2077, an older title, but one that can utilize the CPU's multiple threads and cores, and can be CPU bound in many instances, hence the scene that I've chosen here is Dogtown. What's interesting to see here is that our best performance comes from having the E-cores disabled while leaving hyper-threading on. 
Now, credit to the devs, they actually updated the game a while back when Alder Lake came out with a P-Core mode, which tells the game to ignore the E-Cores while they're still active, and I found that there is a performance boost. So use that if you don't want to mess around with the BIOS. This is a pretty cool feature because this game is an example of where E-Cores can slightly start to hurt performance, and so I wish more devs would actually take this cue from the Cyberpunk devs and start to implement this feature in their game. So for the non-tech savvy users, they can actually just flick the switch in the options menu and utilize it that way. Next up, we've got Baldur's Gate 3, which can be a pretty CPU bound game. And here we can see that when it comes to the average FPS for all the configurations, they're relatively the same. And the same can be said for the 1% lows. No major changes, but the 0.1% lows were considerably more stable when we disabled hyper-threading and left the E-Cores enabled. Next up, we have a game that could very well win Game of the Year, and that's Expedition 33. This game also runs on UE5, and performance I feel like could be better, but it's not near as bad as some of the other UE5 titles we've looked at that graphically look inferior. And when we tested the three configurations, Performance was relatively the same across the board, albeit with a slight advantage for the 0.1% lows when the E-Cores were disabled. Moving on, and we have another Game of the Year candidate, and that's Kingdom Come Deliverance 2. And this game just runs like absolute butter, regardless of whichever configuration you were looking at. With that said, we can see that performance overall was better when we disabled hyper-threading and left E-Cores enabled, resulting in the highest average FPS and the best 1% and 0.1% lows. Lies of P is a very fun Souls-like game, and the game is optimized quite well by the devs. It actually runs on UE4, but in my opinion looks better than a number of UE5 games we've looked at, proving newer isn't always better depending on the dev team. We can see that performance across the board is relatively the same, and no configuration offers any major advantages over the other in the three measured stats. Stalker 2 is next, and this game also runs on UE5. The devs have been providing their player base with multiple updates, and they have made performance improvements since it came out, so credit to them. This game does scale well with multiple cores, and that shows here as the two configurations with E cores enabled will provide the user with the highest average FPS and higher lows. The last game on our list is The Last of Us Part 2, and this game doesn't seem to be drastically impacted in any way, whether that's the average FPS or the lows when disabling hyper-threading or E-Cores. All configurations offer virtually the same experience. When we take a look at our 16 game average, we can see that all three configurations are basically neck and neck with each other. Sure, there might have been one or two games that favored one of the configurations over the others. However, for the most part, the experience you're going to get if you opt to turn off E-Cores, turn off hyper-threading, or just leave it at stock to begin with, is going to be virtually identical. So the bottom line is, based on the testing that I've done, is that there are no major performance advantage. I'm not going to be recommending to people that, you know, you should turn off your E-Cores, and that's going to immensely boost your performance because I personally didn't experience that. However, what we do need to actually take into consideration is power usage, and the configuration where we had turned off the 16 E cores resulted in the best efficiency gains. So if you're just gaming and you want to reduce power as much as possible, or you're looking to give your P cores more headroom for boosting, or you're looking to you know manually push them much further, then turning off the 16 E cores will be beneficial for you. Now, do keep in mind, though, that Silicon Lottery does also come into play there, and in some cases, it can really come into play there hard and could limit you before, you know, your 14900K or 13900K is power limited. Because for me, my chip, when it came to its peak cores for the 14900K, I was hitting a wall at 5.8 gigahertz. 5.9 gigahertz was just requiring too much voltage, and unfortunately, that's just the luck of the draw when it comes to silicon quality. And realistically, another 100 megahertz wouldn't even net you that much of a big jump in terms of performance or FPS. But the other thing I did want to discuss was how you'll definitely come across users online talking about how they experienced a larger boost in gaming performance or that their lows became a lot more stable once they had turned off the e-cores. It seemed like it was running smoother for them. I think what it may come down to or what's happening here is that either they're using Windows 10, and this is something that 
I actually have to test for myself and once I get some more time on my hands. But I've heard that when you run the e-cores on Windows 10, things just don't play nicely there because apparently with Intel's thread director, it wasn't really optimized or tuned properly for Windows 10 scheduler. So it seems to just kind of shit the bed there. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'll have to retest this when I get some time because remember, benchmarking, it does take a lot of time. You have to do you know, multiple runs for each configuration to ensure consistency and to emit bad runs, and then repeat that again for all the different configurations you're testing. The other theory that I have is that a lot of people who said their system and gaming performance was better with the eCores disabled are probably running their chip with stock Intel power limits or power tuning configurations. And what's happening there is that their chip is probably thermal throttling or power throttling with the eCores enabled, resulting in sporadic clock speed swings and leading to unstable lows. And then when they disabled the e-cores, that gave their p-cores more thermal and power headroom to boost and keep the clocks stable. Hence, you see them saying that, hey, my lows actually increased or my system seemed to run smoother. And if you're someone who can't or you know just doesn't want to spend any time power tuning their chip in the BIOS, then I recommend this is probably the best route for you. But when it comes to my personal choice, the way I run my 14900K and even in my personal system is that I've power tuned them and adjusted the ACDC load line configurations on them, which results in my chip running more efficiently and actually keeping its stock clocks more stable and locked, even when the e-cores are enabled. In fact, for this video's testing and for a lot of the previous benchmarking I've done, I actually had my P-Cores running at 5.8 gigahertz and my E-Cores were actually slightly bumped to 4.6 gigahertz and it actually keeps those clocks stable and you can see that while I'm running the games. So this is what has actually resulted in the best performance in my use cases because I'm still able to maintain really good multi-core performance that way and my gaming performance is still stellar as well. I personally haven't noticed any drastic changes from stock or with the E-Cores disabled performance is just on just as on par and as you guys saw from my benchmarks that is definitely the case once you have the chip properly power tuned so i recommend you know playing around with the settings and testing things out from the bios yourself and see what works best in your use case or environment but for now that's going to be wrapping up things for this one i hope you guys all learned something and we'll touch base in the next video take care if you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.